Cool. Well, we just finished fine tuning an agent, so we're going to hop into retrieval systems. So, totally on the other side. Uh, we're lucky to have Jerry from Llama Index and Elon from Pinecone here today. So, uh, Jerry, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, um, I'm Jerry, uh, co founder and CEO of Llama Index, and yeah, excited to be here. We'll talk right after. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Elon. I'm the uh, VP of product at uh, Pinecone. I've uh, been at Pinecone for about a year. Before that, I was at Google, uh, responsible for the, uh, basically the back end of Google search um, on the product side. Cool. Maybe before I, I ask some questions, can I get a show of hands? Who has uh, you know, used Pinecone or used Llama Index to build some sort of retrieval augmented system? OK. That's wow, pretty decent, decent crew. OK. Well, just for the folks who are still haven't tried it, uh, maybe Elon, you could just jump into why do you need a vector store? Why, you know, why, what's, what's its use in this LLM ecosystem? Uh, okay, that's a, that's a very uh, broad question. Um, so I, I assume you guys all know what vector embeddings are for. So if, if you have a whole bunch of vector embeddings and you want to do a uh, nearest neighbor search on them, uh, you need some kind of a vector index. So I guess the, the next question is, why do you need something like Pinecone as opposed to uh, some open source uh, library? Because uh, approximate nearest neighbor as an algorithm is quite simple, and you can code it yourself in Python. Um, and one way to think about it is the, the analogy could be like SQLite. You can get a library that uh, runs SQL on your laptop or embedded as part of uh, your application versus you know, MongoDB or, or a spanner. So if you want something that uh, is easy to use, just works, can scale with the application, is enterprise ready, can support not just thousands of vectors, but millions, hundreds of millions, and, and billions, and it just keeps working at low latency, is bulletproof, then that's when you need a, a vector database like a Pineco. Cool. Jerry, do you want to jump in on when do you need an orchestration layer like Llama Index? Yeah, um, I mean, uh, let's see. I, um, most people these days, like, I mean, you start off like using OpenAI or your, you know, your favorite LLM, open source LLM, um, and the high level is like, okay, how do you actually build a chatbot with this, right? Uh, and like, honestly, for a lot of people, you could probably start off by just doing it yourself, like, just do the prompts, use the OpenAI SDK. You don't necessarily need like Llama Index or Langtrain, um, you know, just like go and try out a bunch of prompts and see what happens. Um, I think typically, though, what happens is that as you kind of like scale a little bit beyond this, like as you start having kind of more production grade needs, uh, you start worrying about, okay, what is like the volume of data that I'm actually ingesting into something uh, like Pinecone or a vector database? How do I like uh, kind of play around with my data parameters? Like I'm sure you guys have all played around with stuff like chunk sizing, metadata extraction. Like, how do you actually play around with that transform layer? Um, how do you plug in like different LLMs very easily and just swap stuff in and out? Um, how do you play around with like different retrieval algorithms of like an orchestration layer or more precisely like a framework is that allows you to just like plug in different things. And I think one of the advantages of Llama Index is that we have like kind of different levels of abstraction for everybody. So if you're just starting out, you can basically build a chatbot in about three lines of code with Llama Index. And if you're one of those more advanced users, we basically allow you to kind of customize any one of those aspects that you want and basically create your own things while still using the rest of the framework. Cool. I'm my borrowing yours. <laughs> cool. Um, all right, well, I'm going to jump into the theme of this whole event, getting stuff actually into production. Um, and you both probably see a lot of applications that are actually trying to get, get into the real world. What are some of the pains you're seeing? Why is it hard for people to get what they're building on a Twitter demo into the real world? Um. Yeah. Oh, um, I think I think like um, I mean we just talked about like LLM evals. Um, how many of you guys have run into just like performance issues when you try to like build a chatbot, right? And then there's things that like it, you know just don't work. Like raise your hands. I'm just curious. Um, okay, cool. Yeah. So it's like pretty much everybody building LLM apps runs into these issues, and especially for stuff like RAG. Um, it turns out one of the reasons this happens is because of like bad retrieval, right? Like if you have bad context going in. Sorry. Yeah, we have bad context. Um, oh, okay. 
The mics are against you. Right, right, right. Um, <laughs> if you have bad context going into the model, oh, that was my friend. Um, then um, yeah, then then it doesn't matter how good the model is. It's just not going to know how to answer the question. And so really thinking about how to tune your retrieval system is actually quite important. I'll cover some of that in the talk as well. Uh, but yeah, I can elaborate more. But I'll pass it to Elon. Yeah. So uh, at Pinecone, we get to see uh, a huge diversity of, uh, of of users and different use cases. Everything from uh, you know, students that are, that are running some notebooks to uh, small startups that have uh, trying to use, create some new innovative uh, uh, business based on, uh, on generative AI and need, uh, and need a vector database as part of it. Um, through like tech forward companies with uh, millions of, uh, of users that, you know, they provide, uh, they have an application that has millions of users and as part of it they want to enable uh, generative AI or semantic search or something like that as part of it and, uh, and they, they build us into a solution like that all the way up to large uh, enterprises and uh, even highly regulated ones like, uh, like financial institutions. So the, the types of challenges are, um, are, are fairly different at each stage. Like some people care about um, a huge scale um, but want really, really low cost. When I say huge scale, they want a huge number of vectors, like billions or tens of billions of vectors, but very low QPS. And they're not worried about security. This is like an offline, you know, or every so often, you know, query uh, pattern. Um, and then there's others that um, need, um, you know, need the opposite. They, it needs to be, um, needs to work super fast because it's uh, part of some recommendation system or some sort of live uh, consumer facing uh, interaction. It needs very low latency. Um, potentially highly regulated, so security and uh, deployment and uh, things like VPNs and private link and encryption and all that starts, starts coming into play. And then, and then they start worrying about, okay, where does our data go? Where, uh, you know, should we be sending all of our proprietary internal data over the wire to open AI? Or do we need to, you know, train and run our own model within our own environments, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think what's happening is, is uh, this room as an industry is uh, we're gradually growing up like the rest of the world has discovered generative AI and the, sp the spotlights on us and these big companies that um, usually arrive at a space like this a couple of years later are suddenly jumping on us and we're not quite, not quite ready. We're not quite ready for the, for the big leagues yet. So we're all scrambling and trying to figure out, okay, how do we how do we play in the big leagues? What do we need to do? How do we, um, how do we get set up to really be enterprise ready? Yep. Out of curiosity, have you seen a rag app with uh, a pine cone with like a billion vectors in it? So we, we definitely have uh, uh, many customers with uh, billions of vectors. Uh, are they specifically using rag or just semantic search? Let me, I have to think about that for oh, no a worries, I was just curious. I'd be interested in like the scalability challenges. But. But I, I think so. I, th I yeah, thinking about, thinking about that really quickly. I think we definitely do have customers doing rag with billions of vectors for sure. That's cool. Got it. Mo yeah. Consumer application type things. Um, <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Like imagine imagine uh, a, a, a company that provides a service to millions of users. Each one of those users has a whole bunch of documents or other data, and uh, they want to allow them to you know, chat or whatever uh, with, with, with that data. So yes. Got it, got it, got it. Well, the big question that I wanted to spend a big chunk of this discussing was both of you guys really think deeply about how to improve retrieval. If retrieval's not great, the end result or the response isn't gonna be great. Um, and Jerry, you've actually written a lot about things like how, do you, how to better chunk or how to better parameterize. And, and there's a lot of different techniques about this. Um, how do you recommend someone get started even knowing, do I need to improve retrieval? And then where should they start with, with improving retrieval? Yeah, this doesn't really answer your question, but you know, I was kind of <laughs> looking at the slides um, I had in mind uh, like as I was preparing for the talk that I'm doing right after this, and, and half of it was on improving retrieval, and then half of it was actually on fine tuning. And then I figured given that it was like topical, I'm gonna start with the fine tuning piece. Uh, but I'll share the slides later on. Half of it is about like improving retrieval stuff and, and try to link to some of the docs if you guys are interested. Um, I think like in terms of improving retrieval, like 
I mean, for most people, like when you just start out, like what is the accepted standard for building RAG, right? Like you take in a bunch of PDFs and then you do some like sentence splitting on it, like every thousand tokens or something, and you shove it into a vector database, right? Um, that's your data ingest step. And then during data querying, what you do is you uh, do top case semantic search. You know, you fetch like the 10, 20, whatever most popular documents from your vector DB, and you stuff it into the prompt. And these days, like uh, frameworks like Llama Index and Line Train have like abstractions that help you just like deal with overflowing context windows when you try to stuff a bunch of stuff into the prompt. So I think the issue with this is that you know, you're kind of like hamstring the retrieval system because this stuff, like the top K stuff is like very basic. Information retrieval has been around for like, a, like 20 years or something. And you're basically just like trying to fetch like the most relevant documents. And what this means is that you're kind of injecting a ton of data decisions, right? That actually affect the performance of your RAG pipeline. That's completely independent of like how well the, the LM performs. Um, and so for a lot of like complex questions and complex data sets, for a lot of tasks that you want to solve, this like top K retrieval really isn't going to cut it. And so we thought a lot about just like, how do you deal with like kind of complex retrieval in like different settings? And so one approach here is just like, you know, I'll just outline like two basic techniques. Um, Pinecone has like metadata filters. You should use metadata filters generally because it adds like structured tagging on top of your data. And one thing you can do is like with auto retrieval in Llama Index, you can have the LLM not just do like, uh, well, you, you don't just do like top K embedding lookup, you actually infer the set of metadata filters, right, to actually um, define as your query in addition to your semantic query. Um, the other piece here is that you can try indexing your documents like hierarchically. So first index them by their summaries before indexing them by the raw chunks. For a variety of reasons, this leads to like better retrieval of the documents, of the relevant set of documents first before you actually kind of like fetch the relevant chunks. But yeah, that's something to deal on. Oh, shit, that's I'll keep going here. E Elon, any thoughts on that? <laughs> um, so basically we're talking about quality. like how Quality of retrieval, quality. yep. I mean, I think the first thing is to understand what your quality is yep. and be able to, to measure it and evaluate it. And, uh, um, and I think, yeah, you need a benchmark. You need, you need to be able to um, see, see what's going on. Um, so that, that's the first thing. Um, and the second thing is, uh, again, we, are, we see ourselves as the infrastructure layer, like underneath this la layer of the stack, but we get to deal with lots of customers who are running into these questions. And we see that there's a lot of uh, people that are still struggling to figure out the basics, like what is the right you know, chunking strategy? Um, mm. What is the right way to prompt? How many tokens do I use? Like really, really basic questions. I, I imagine a year from now when we sit in, uh, you know, in this room again, a lot of this stuff will be, will be figured out and there'll be best practices. Uh, maybe a lot of this will be automated. Or we're all just fine tuning. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, yeah, so, 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 but again, this, this, this whole world of search quality has been, uh, you know, it's not new. There's, there's lots of, uh, um, you know, techniques and lots of layers in the stack that we're considering even Pinecone is considering building, like, you know, um, second stage ranking. Um, yep. Uh, you know, th th there's, yeah, basically there's a ton of existing um, um, work in this space that we need to, you know, once we get there, we'll start figuring it out and adding it to, to this world. Got it, got it, got it. All right, I have one more question before I open it up to questions, so get, get your thoughts ready. Um, last question I'll end on is, and I think, Elon, you, this was kind of from our conversation, was uh, how do you measure? I, I think the retrieval is one component, but it comes down to the, end, the, the response that the user sees. Um, you know, how should you tie back the, if the responses are hallucinatory, how do you want to tie that back to retrieval? Or how do we even in the beginning measure if the responses are hallucinatory? Oh gosh, I think you're the expert yeah. on that. But certainly, <laughs> I want to hear your think. take, I want to hear your take on, on you know, anything I mean, that you see, you see folks out there doing today or, or measuring? That's a great question. I mean, I, I can tell you what we've uh, built internally for our own use cases. So we've done similar things to what was uh, mentioned here, like using uh, LLMs as a, as a way to um, measure the quality of the output and create sort of golden uh, data sets with the right answers, uh, the, at least a human has ranked, has, has tagged as the right answer. And then, and then you can track, you know, how, how close are we? So, I mean, I think these are two, you know, fairly uh, known techniques that we've yep. used. Got it, 
Yeah, got it. Cool. Well, uh, I'm going to open it up for a couple questions. Morgan, how are we doing on time? Okay, perfect. Uh, I'll take questions. Yeah. One is that uh, the fine tuning and the rag are considered kind of like a competitor, right? You know, when we first started this one, we say we can either do a rag or, you know, like using the index uh, and embeddings versus doing fine tuning, especially to find more specific or in context type of information. So in this case, you know, with the fine tuning of uh, you know GPT 3.5 and then upcoming 4.0 fine tuning, what do you see as the long-term advantage versus kind of like a, you know the importance of these two different approach? And also, the second question is that there's a connection to other things like, for example, we use like a knowledge graph, you know, traditional knowledge graph, and also hierarchical search and other ways to try to pin down to the right context and also getting the right answer. And how do you use these two approach in combination with other approaches to improve the uh, quality of your generation as well as the reasoning uh, for your large language models? It's a great question, great question. Do you guys wanna kick, um, kick off? Go for it. Yeah, I think there are like uh, two questions in there. I'll maybe start with the second one. Um, so uh, I think you were asking about like knowledge graphs as well as uh, kind of other like uh, different ways besides like semantic search. I mean, yeah, so, so I think that like that's all kind of falls under the category of like retrieval augmented generation. It's not necessarily just like top key embedding lookup. Um, so we're actually actively investigating some of this stuff. So a lot of the kind of retrieval mechanisms, yeah, I think a lot of it is like you can combine like semantic search actually with, for instance, some sort of graph-based structure and then you can like recursively fetch more context either through like a knowledge graph or through some like other modeling of like hierarchies within like a vector database or something. Um, so those are things that we're, we're definitely like super interested in. Um, some thoughts on just like fine tuning versus rag. I think they're like complementary before they're competitive. Like I think there is a future, like by the way, like you know, like coming from machine learning, it's like interesting to think about. There is a future where like, you know, you just like continuously fine tune everything and then like, you know, you just have this model like do gradient descent over like new data and then somehow it just magically like works, right? And I'm not gonna like rule that, rule that future out. But I think there's a real argument, regardless of kind of like uh, what, how powerful that is, uh, of like UX. Uh, it is way easier to do RAG than fine tuning, just like in terms of the amount of hours that you and your data science or engineering team need to set up. Like you don't need to think about getting human labeled data. You don't need ML expertise. You just like, you know, use Llama index or line chain, like 30 minutes, you'll, you'll have something up and running. Whereas fine tuning tends to take much longer to try to iterate on like good results, at least right now. There's a great graph out there, I think Andrej Karpathy put out, that was like ROI of fine tuning versus like the ROI of you know, using a retrieval augmented generation. Agree with you, I don't see them as competitors, I see them as compatible. They're kind of solving somewhat different problems. In my opinion, the you know, RAG is connecting it to your own proprietary data, so you can answer questions on top of that. Um, fine tuning, kind of like what we were talking about with Elon before, I'm seeing it more as you know, used for form, not for facts. So used to help you figure out how to structure your outputs and, and that's more of what I'm seeing in the real world. Um, and so it, it, it's just, I see most people start with RAG today. Very few, I don't know. I might say it's like 1% maybe that are fine tuning. I don't know, that's, that's my take on what we see at least. Yeah, I, I, think, um, I think that all makes uh, a lot of sense. So the way my mental model is uh, an, an LLM is uh, like a brain, it's like the reasoning engine, and, um, and forcing it to not only be uh, the reasoning engine, but also to memorize a whole bunch of facts is kind of insane and, and not, not very efficient. Um, much better to have a much smaller, smart reasoning engine and maybe fine tune it so it outputs what, you know, in the format you want and just keep all the facts somewhere else. And the facts can be in a vector database, they can be in a knowledge graph, depending on the nature of the data. Um, knowledge graph is fantastic for, for certain, uh, certain types of data. Um, so yeah, so I think uh, this combination, I think will continue to exist.